everybody, so we're back talking some more Monarch Legacy of Monsters on the channel. Episode 5, we've reached the official midway point of the season. Now, as far as what Episode 5 lacks in the Kaiju department, it makes up for all around as far as digging deeper into Kate as a character and flushing out a little bit more of her backstory. Despite the fact that all of them were captured by Monarch at the tail end of Episode 4, it doesn't amount to all of that much, at least in the episode. Even when they're all separated in their own individual cells, the debate on what to do with them goes pretty much exactly how you would expect pondering whether or not to just recruit them to monarch or letting them go with some level of supervision which i mean that is the obvious choice they're going to go with thus leading to kate kentaro and may being sent back to san francisco which still does look pretty rough after g-day there's even advertisements on tvs in the background selling bunkers for people after many times we only heard her over the phone when she talks to kate we're finally introduced in person to kate's mother the actress that plays kate's mom might be somebody that you familiar with as she's played by Tamlin Tomita aka Kamiko from the Karate Kid Part 2 and Cobra Kai. What starts off initially is just a nice little reunion between Kate and her mother pretty much immediately becomes awkward because there's just no subtlety introducing Kentaro to her. You probably noticed by now that unfortunately Lee did not go back with Kate's group to San Francisco. In general this is one of my favorite sequences of the entire episode. It's just a great sequence all around. A large part that plays into it is just how awesome Kurt Russell is, how cool and smug Lee is during this interrogation, playing into the situation with Deputy Director Verdugo, and not buying into her mind games at all, even kind of ribbing some of the stuff that some of us as fans loved about the 2014 film. One of which I definitely didn't agree with, and it's the fact that he wasn't a big fan of Sarazawa saying let them fight. It also brings up the question on how does he know Sarazawa said that? It's something that's been brought up in passing over the course of these last couple weeks. That is the mystery swirling around Lee Shaw. Age. Based on what we know, Lee Shaw was born in 1924, which considering the fact this show is set in 2015, that would make him roughly about 91 years old. How does he look so good for being apparently over 90 years old? Maybe it's because of him being around Titan so much, slowing down his aging somehow. Maybe that insurance for Monarch is just absolutely insane, or he has some great skincare tips. All I know is he's very spry for someone that's getting close to 100 years old. Now when we come back to Kate's storyline, episode 5 does delve deeper into several facets of her trauma, which were surprisingly complex and emotional. Apparently after what happened on G-Day, all Kate had been doing was just wasting away in her room. That lingering trauma. You do get a little bit more of that backstory later on while we're traversing through her old stomping ground. By this point, I've kind of gotten used to the rapid fire editing style employed, but there even are still points to me I find a bit jarring. Here we're going from this emotional moment between Kate and her mother, then cut right to sneaking into the zone to try and get the rest of Hiroshi's belongings. We intersplice in more flashbacks to Kate and the lead up to G-Day. Whether or not this was done intentionally or not, I did think it was a really cool touch. Well, we do cut to these flashbacks, and it's G-Day minus two, and then G-Day minus one, because Godzilla minus one just came out, and that was the first thing I thought of immediately when they popped up on screen. Have you seen Godzilla minus one yet? If you have, I'd love to know your thoughts about it down below. It's huge look look inside of Kate's past was filled with some big surprises that I hadn't anticipated. Firstly being the fact that she had a girlfriend. She was seeing this woman named Danny. They appeared to have a complicated relationship to put it lightly. It seemed like before G-Day happened, Kate feared stability in her life and that does carry over into her relationship. When there were talks of taking the next step with Danny, clearly that was something she wasn't ready for because we do cut to later on and she's just sleeping with another woman entirely. So in general, a very messy situation has only made worse by all the events surrounding G-Day. Another cool detail and another way to link this story back to the 2014 film is when we get to see Kate with her kids in the classroom. The kids are watching that news report that we saw back in the 2014 film, Godzilla fighting the Muto. What's also so insane to me is the fact that not even Godzilla could close schools. They literally had to wait till Godzilla was basically destroying San Francisco for them to believe that this was actually gonna be a threat to their schoolwork. In between a lot of this heavy material, Thankfully, there was at least 
some moments of levity here and there. Like when Kentaro and Kate bring up the goofy things that their father used to do. It's just too bad that they are talking and laughing a little bit too loudly, considering they're being chased once again by soldiers through this area. But they got pretty lucky because there were other people down there that got chased by the soldiers instead. Fortunately, after all of these different hurdles, we finally get to them finding Hiroshi's stuff, but it's never that simple. It's never simple, these monarch people. It's always cryptic. I don't know how long this operation took, but the sun came out. If they didn't have the sun, they wouldn't have been able to figure out Hiroshi's cryptic map. Sunlight is the main key to figuring out the secret to Hiroshi's map, using that sunlight to project onto these punched holes in the paper. Just further proven because one of the dots is in Alaska. Thus, the journey continues to try and locate Hiroshi. But then there's Mei, who's been kind of suspicious ever since the beginning. Back in the earlier portion of the episode when May was discussing things with Michelle at Monarch. As it turns out, the two of them have some line of communication ever since May left. So that's going to be very exciting to see where all of that stuff goes in the future of the show. Yeah, all around a pretty solid episode. It's just unfortunate that this is probably the episode so far that has the least amount of kaiju titan action. Either way, show your thoughts down below. How'd you feel about episode 5 of Monarch Legacy of Monsters? Did you like the episode? Did you not like the episode? Show your thoughts down down below if you have any theories where you think you're going to go with the rest of the episode thank you guys as always for checking out the videos i always do appreciate it make sure you like on the video and also subscribe to the channel so you have the reviews reactions unboxings and more for the next time see you guys later